We'll begin in just one moment while people are logging on. Hello and welcome. I'm Robert Riggs, CEO of the Scleroderma Foundation, and on behalf of Scleroderma Canada, Scleroderma Research Foundation, and the Scleroderma Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This is the fifth collaborative webinar between the three North American Scleroderma organizations. I know I speak for the leadership and team members of all three organizations when I express how proud I am to be part of such a dynamic and caring community that is coming together to support one another in ways that offer help and hope during this challenging and stressful time. I'd especially like to thank my colleagues, Maureen Sauvé, founding president, board member, and Adv advocacy chair of Scleroderma Canada, Rob Tufel, executive director of Scleroderma Research Foundation, SRF team members, Gloria Bletcha and Joanne Gold, who are our fantastic tech supports on these webinars, and Carrie Connolly, Director of Programs and Services at the Scleroderma Foundation, who has put together topics and speakers for these presentations. Our thanks to so many of you, too, who support the work and mission of your scleroderma organizations, even in these uncertain times. We couldn't do it without you. We're also grateful to our corporate sponsors, Actilian Pharmaceuticals and Boehringer Ingelheim. So just a couple housekeeping issues before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. A link that includes the slide presentation will be available and on each of the three organizations' websites for you to review and share with others. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. You can click there and we ask that you type questions that you may have throughout the presentation. And my colleagues Maureen and Rob will facilitate posing them to Dr. Sakaku during the question and answer period following her presentation. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Leslie Ann Sakaku. Dr. Sakaku holds an MD and a Master's of Public Health and trained in pediatrics and internal medicine at Tulane University in New Orleans and in rheumatology at Louisiana State University. She is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Louisiana State University School of Medicine and director of the Scleroderma and Sarcoidosis Patient Care and Research Center. In 2011, she established the Scleroderma and Sarcoidosis Patient Care and Research Center between Tulane and LSU, which has received international recognition. She also established the Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic program at LSU, which is now the LSU Tulane Collaborative Comprehensive Pulmonary Hypertension Center, where she is co-director of the clinical research and director of wellness practices. Dr. Sakaku leads international and local workshops for patients and medical professionals in mindfulness in medicine, as well as teaching programs of safe, self-paced exercise for patients with cardiopulmonary disease and other chronic illnesses. We're delighted to have her present A Beautiful Place, Physical Health in Scleroderma Through, Mind, Through the Mind Body Garden. Please welcome Dr. Sakaku. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Scleroderma Research Foundation, the Scleroderma Foundation, and our friends at Scleroderma Canada. We have a close relationship and I'm deeply gratified to be here today to do this 
very special, special to me uh, event. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. I will just flash my disclosures and just have a quick laugh and see the little comic strip being human's best friend. <laughs> so, um, so welcome to this webinar. It's important to me. A beautiful place, physical health and sperm from the mind body garden. We're talking about place and what are we referring to? So we're referring to spaces and places that are just there and present in all of us. And these are the places that mindfulness or non-judgmental awareness and movement technique help to augment that help us be our better responsive self, help us feel better in ourself, help us relate to others. So those are places, place within our mind, place within our mind, within our heart, our physical bodies, and the environment in which we live in, the, the environment with which we move in. So beautiful spaces um, that augment and we practice our beauty of these spaces through non-judgmental engagement. Um, we're running a gap of groundwork to cultivate both mental and physical uh, openness that leads to a deeper strength and stamina and endurance of our bodies and our minds. Um, so, um, I think this is, yes. <laughs> um, so these places are supportive techniques that are interconnected, when our mind flows in as well, our body feels better. When our body feels better, it's easy for our mind to work well. Um, and they're interconnected and scientifically supported. I'm gonna keep saying that because it is important that we recognize that there's great other science that has been done in these areas. Um, so interconnected with each other, these places are, and interconnected uh, in our selves and our lives. So um, they allow us also, when we practice being in these beautiful places, it allows us to be more readily able to deal and cope and be with stress and be with distress, whether it's our own distress or the distress of others. Um, so. Excuse me, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Okay. Sakaku. Um, I think your mic is cutting out. So is, can ah. you please try and position your, you were fine before. Can you try and position yourself a little differently? I don't know if you're leaning up okay. against something. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. That's perfect. Yeah, that sounds okay. much better. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll be careful. Great. And thank thank you, you so much. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is, um, this is the science. It's just part of everyday life. It's nothing magical. It's something that is therefore for all of us and to practice as day days minimum. So so who is me? My name you know you heard it is Leslie Ann Sackett Um and this is a photo of me and my dad and you might recognize it from an article from the Scleroderma Voice uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, I'm uh, as um, as uh, Robert pointed out, I'm a, a scleroderma researcher, uh, clinical trials design and development. These things are very important to me. Um, supporting the growth of pharmaceutical interventions for systemic sclerosis to prevent the progression of the disease and, and to save lives and, and, and preserve quality of life. But at the same time, I am dedicated to a whole other arm of science because I believe, and I have seen for myself, how it has impacted positively patients' lives that are ability to cope with disease and, and possibly ameliorate symptoms. Um, so before being an MD, I was a special needs teacher and a performance artist and applied these techniques to my special needs populations um, to target um, particular cognitive or physical uh, needs or impairments of that uh, population in order to augment strength in those areas. Um, so, but in addition to being a dancer, and that's perhaps where I feel really tied to this concept of um, the power of movement to uphold our health and, and cultivate joy, 
Um, I also practiced Iyengar yoga since I was 16, but from a book. I was, you know, where I lived, we didn't really have a lot of those options. So I practiced for years from a book. So there you go. Everything counts and anybody can be on the road to anything, right? So, uh, but later in order to how to get better strategies for my students and of course my patients, um, the past decades I trained and received teaching certifications in several disciplines of yoga and attempting to try to get the full picture of movement and, and healing movement. Um, and, um, and I've been teaching yoga in some form or another ever since the 80s. Um, and further to that, uh, went on to learn and receive certifications in trauma-sensitive yoga and accessible yoga uh, for people of all levels of ability. Um, and then been studying the Pilates since the 80s and also received a one certification in that, you know, it's like geekiness. But um, so coming back to my dad and this picture, um, my dad, if you read the article, he also had an autoimmune disease with severe Raynaud's joint swelling, recurrent pleural effusions, uh, uh, blood hematological derangements, and ultimately he developed pancreatic cancer. And I moved back uh, to where my parents lived uh, to be with them at this time and to, and to work. But um, <laughs> so I made, I made my dad engage in yoga every day and uh, we did it together and he did it by himself and I would check in on him by telephone. Did you do yoga today? Anyway, it was usual for him to say when I was trying to uh, engage him in this, oh, Leslie. Um, and he would kind of say this joke that would help soften the anxiety of the inevitable, which was, uh, you're going to kill me, knowing that he had pancreatic cancer. But it was a, um, but he did it. And, um, and, and he would say that it preserved his function up until the very end. And that was super important and preserved his quality of life. Um, and he would say, you know, I really notice a difference if I don't do it. Um, and and that, was, that was on a daily basis. So the reason that I'm sharing this is because I know that when you have a chronic illness, when you're living with a chronic illness, sometimes it takes an awful lot to, to bring your motivation up and over that hump to be able to engage in something that's good for us. Um, yes. So, um, so just a matter of prep, anything that we do during this mini workshop is going to be safe. This is a self-paced workshop and you listen to your bodies. Um, and if you stay in that listening and pleasurable mode, you're gonna stay safe. Um, and anything that we do, anything that we do can be done in standing, it can be done sitting, it can be done holding onto a chair, it can be done leaning into a chair, and if needed, it can, they can also be done lying down. And I'm going to try to remember to give all those cues. Um, if, you, if you happen to be an oxygen user, everything that we're doing is going to be safe for oxygen users. Um, I would ask you to be mindful though, that if you do require dialing up your oxygen for uh, low levels of exertion, um, to please do so. Um, so take that time just to double check that you have the oxygen requirement you need. Um, and the only other thing is, please don't wear very restrictive clothes. You see, I'm not, so um, indeed. Um, so what we're gonna see is also, we're gonna see a sneak peek of some of the things that we've been working on, sequences and exercise developed specifically for cardiopulmonary rehab um, and accelerated enhancements in poor people living with cardiopulmonary or autoimmune disease, supported by grants from these organizations, uh, the Charles and Elizabeth Whitmore Foundation and the uh, Sarcoidosis Awareness Foundation of Louisiana with mentoring and outreach organizations uh, supporting uh, through um, Alvin Alley, Martha Graham Downs Foundation, Anna Halpern, Iyengar Yoga of New York City, NOVA, which is New Orleans Ballet Association, and NORD. Um, as well as the Jose Limon Dance Company. Um, 
the so they supported the dissection and convergence uh, of dance and yoga techniques to heighten and accelerate targeted strength and agility when living with cardiopulmonary disease um, or an autoimmune disease. Um, so what I will going to what we're going to do is if everybody wouldn't mind if you're able to stand that's wonderful if it's out of the ability range for today for you it's perfectly fine to stay standing uh, to say stand, sitting but what we're going to be doing is we're going to be my keycap what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sensitizing and strengthening this workshop is focusing on the hands feet mouth upper body and torso lower body hips and legs our breath lung health um, and using sound and vibration to enhance uh, all of these um, areas as well as impacting GI um, motility. So I'm going to stand because I feel like I'm able today to stand and I just want everybody to take a moment and as the gentle breath moves in, enjoy the arms coming up. <sighs> And as the gentle breath moves in. And in your own time, you don't have to keep pace with me at all. This is your time. This is your exercise. And okay. So, um, so what I'd like to do now is if you're standing, come and take a comfortable seat. If you're seated on the floor, I'm gonna ask you to please sit on a cushion so that your bottom is elevated to at least the height of your knees or, uh, uh, or just a little bit above. And so what I'd like you to do is we're just going to embark on a small snippet of the foundations of what we're gonna be doing today, which is mindfulness practice or non-judgmental awareness. So find yourself a comfortable seated position. Allow your body to feel comfortable and held within the chair. Allow your feet to find the floor. Feel comfortable with the floor. Allow your shoulders to soften, open, belly soften. And now allow your eyes, if you're comfortable, to soften, to either close or to a comfortable hazy gaze in front of you, whatever is most comfortable for you. And now just rest your hands in your lap, just so that you can still make contact somehow with that lovely belly of yours. And notice how the belly rises into the palms of the hands or against your sh forearms. And as the belly recedes gently from your hands or forearms or even upper arms. Allow your attention to lightly rest upon that sensation, the contact between your torso, abdomen, and your hands or your lower arm. And if your mind wanders, as it will, because that's what minds do, you just smile at yourself and invite your mind once again, your attention once again, to rest upon the changing sensation between your torso and your arm, your hand.
So mind wandering happens all the time. The point of mindfulness exercises are to simply notice. And if your mind wanders, you're kind to yourself. And just invite your mind once again to return to that changing sensation of the contact between your arm, hand, and your abdomen. And when you are ready, take your three last breath cycles in your own time. And then join us again at the webinar. <laughs> Thank you for doing that with me. So what these exercises highlight and what they take advantage of are the sensations between the body and the breath. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be breath. It can be a sensation uh, on your skin or even an imagined sensation or even something you're hearing like rustling of trees or uh, hearing the breeze against your window. Um, any of these objects can be used as a point uh, for our attention to rest on and to practice this non-judgmental attention. Um, so if you noticed, there happened to be kind of three steps to this. And basically what it was, it was allowing our attention to rest upon that sensation, whatever it happened to be, whether it was the air at the tip of our nose or the contact of the belly um, to our hands, or um, maybe even a pressure in our body as the breath changed, like maybe the stretch across our shoulders or, um, or some sound. But, so that was the, that's the first step. We allow our attention, attention to lightly rest. And then the next part is the part that everybody gets frustrated with, but it's the meat of the exercise. You notice when your attention wanders and you say, oh, like a little puppy, my attention wandered. Come back, little puppy, come back. You're nice to yourself. You're kind to yourself. You invite yourself. You're gentle with yourself. Um, invite your attention once again to rest upon the object of your attention. So it's placing your attention, noticing when the attention's wandered, and then the kind invitation and humorful invitation you give your mind again to come back to the uh, mindfulness uh, exercise. So, um, and again, I want to underscore that everything that we do is pleasurable, generous, kind, humorful. Um, so let's try it again. Woo um, we'll do a short one. And this time you are going to be able to choose and there'll be more and longer uh, mindfulness segments um, in the future. You can connect on my new Facebook page um, or um, which is so new to me. Um, uh, but this, we're going to do just a short amount today just to give a flavor, but there will be longer segments available of um, mindfulness activities. So once again, again, this is nothing extraordinary. We slip into this as our, we slip into socks. It's a, not an extravagant thing. It's not a, a, an unattainable divine thing. It's something that's there in all of us. We slip we slip on our mindfulness practice like socks. We find a comfortable seated position, allowing our, our bottom, our legs to feel comfortable and feel supported and buoyed by the chair, our shoulders to feel soft. We gently let our eyes soften to either closed or a hazy gaze in front of us. And then we check in with ourselves. We notice. Notice something and let our attention rest upon it, something pleasurable. 
So for me, it might be the stretch of the space under my arm. For you, it might be the tickling of the air against your nose as the gentle breath moves in or out. Or it might be the whir of the air conditioning. Just allow your attention to rest on whatever sensation you have chosen. Notice how it changes with the gentle, natural inflow and outflow of the breath. Oh, the mind wanders and just be kind, don't be. Oh, you'll notice you're frustrated. Try to soften to that frustration and be kind to yourself. And once again, in your own time, take your last three breaths. Not your last three breaths, last three breath cycles for this exercise. And when you're ready, come back and join us. Um, sorry, Dr. Sakati, let me just interrupt one more time. I think the audio works a little better if you're, if you're further away from the uh, computer. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, like you know, this? I think it's a little bit better that way, yes, thank you. Okay, oh my goodness, wowee. Okay, that's a good sign, that's a good thing. I hope everybody was able to hear me. So I just wanna share that these, these exercises, particularly this mindfulness, um, and then later on in the decades when our government and other governments have, um, and other sponsors had investigated mindfulness attached to movement, bringing an even um, more robust beneficial impact. But for the past decades, we've been finding um, strong support in the use uh, for pain, especially uh, early days when it was done uh, it looking at cancer and cancer treatment, looking at managing nausea, insomnia, fatigue, cognitive disruption, depression, anxiety, um, and looking at the genetics and the epigenetics of inflammation. Yes, yes. And yes, this is very exciting. And this has great impact for, for, for those of us living with a chronic autoimmune disease or many other inflammatory diseases. So, so when we talk about mindful movement, again, we prefer non-judgmental awareness really to mindfulness because it's a less do, do, do type of um, tone. Um, but, um, that could be anything. Mindful movement could be anything. Gentle movement could be yoga. Oh, hundreds of types of yoga that are out there. Walking, dancing. Are you hearing me okay, Rob? Yes, that sounds better. Yeah. Okay, good. Tai Chi. When you're going to your therapy appointments and rehab, these are the times we can be incorporating mindfulness. When we're singing in our choirs, uh, when we're chanting, um, any type of breath sensations that we're doing. I, I hope everybody here was able to take advantage of Dr. Sundar Bala's Subaranian's uh, seminar a, a couple of weeks ago where he focused on breath sensation. Playing a musical instrument is a mindful movement activity. Um, and there are more rigorous types of exercise. If you happen to be a runner or a biker, the pleasure can infuse the sensation and the, the, these um, practices of embodiment infuse and then become better bikers, runners, weightlifters. So listening to the body in motion is what this is all about. And we're practicing for ourselves. And when we practice for ourselves, we're in, enhancing our physical management and coordination our, and our physical and our, and our psychological ease. Um, relations, like I mentioned, related to inflammatory disease. If we're, if we're in this mode, we tap into this way of, of moving and expressing ourselves and connecting with our movement, 
we're less likely to hurt our joints, overstretch our joints, because they're more likely to remain in a, in a lined position. Our joints are allowed to become lubricated. We can accelerate a deeper muscle strength rather than an, a larger, superficial, overbulked, forceful muscle strength. It's a more organic, much deeper strength. Um, and we are working to preserve and enhance uh, muscular neuronal uh, networks and blood vessel networks and enhance, very importantly, our GM utility. So let's talk about one of our favorite subjects, which is health-related quality of life. Health-related quality of life is probably one of the single most important priorities of patients. Um, even the research that we've done in cancer uh, and in pulmonary fibrosis, uh, talking about magnifying quality of life versus days lived because enriching someone's quality of life makes life that much more worth living and tolerable. Uh, and we often view this in the context of medications that might be intolerable. So this was the burgeoning time decades, a couple of decades ago, a decade and a half ago, where we were evaluating how much chemotherapy are we giving people and, and, and to what end. So these were important questions that we started to ask ourselves. Um, and so health-related quality of life takes into account the disease burden and aiming for a cure, but including the patient and what's important to the patient involved in those concepts. And so, and what is health-related quality of life? We're talking about how we're able to be with our families, interacting socially, intimacy, whether or not we're able to keep a job, and um, our, our general overall performance. Um, so why does all this matter for Pete's sake? Um, we're scientists. Well, health-related quality of life is very important. As, um, the inner circle here discusses the concepts behind quality of life that are affected. Um, and on the right-hand column, you see things that increase quality of life. And so if we can amplify these things for our patients, then we have a chance of improving quality of life. And on the left-hand side, things that diminish quality of life. Um, and so if we pay attention to those, we might be able to intercept. Um, we know that towards the end of life, quality of life diminishes. So science, so somebody might be skeptical and say, well, yeah, of course it does. People aren't feeling good. Um, well, we were, there's been several studies in various diseases and even in scleroderma that demonstrated that, that mortality is, 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 and severity of disease is independent uh, so, uh, of quality of life. And quality of life impacts mortality independently, regardless of tumor size, cardiovascular events, um, or the decline of pulmonary functioning or organ scores. Okay, okay, but that, what, how, what does that mean? So, what, what it does mean is there's been studies to show the other side of the coin, that improving quality of life can improve survival in these patients, whether it's psychological symptoms, or um, whether it is symptom distress um, related to physical symptoms. Um, and it, it impacts widely. So, aha, so this does uh, matter to the skeptical mind. So, in these times, what is happening to us in, in these times of COVID 19? We are experiencing, number one, a decrease, extreme decrease in movement, two, this um intense attachment to our devices uh computers and phones and an incredible levels of stress and distress and all of these go toward um diminishing our capacity for health definitely um when we're not moving we we're less likely to be able to control our pain. We are, um, we're not supporting our muscle and nerve health, our joint mobility and lubrication, or GI motility. Um, and the intense use of computers, our telephones, can cause us to close in on ourselves and our muscles become educated in that direction and reinforced in that direction, the muscles of our neck and our torsos and our ribs and our, and that's super important if you're living with a cardiopulmonary disease that, that we um, try to counterbalance that. Um, so, um, 
So one of the things that we can do for ourselves during this time is look up, first of all. So if we're in the computer, we're feeling stressed, something bothers us, or we're left with a bad feeling, we saw something, we can't remember what it was, look up, look anywhere in your room, and you're gonna notice that there's a change. Um, and in Buddhism, it's kind of akin to looking at the big sky and looking around you. Um, but look up and see, um, see something different and then come back to what you're doing if you feel you need to do it. Um, so just for five seconds, I want everyone just to take one minute, let your eyes wander from the screen, and I want you to notice just one thing in your living space, one thing in your living space that you didn't quite notice before. It could be the contour of a book. It could be the way um, your carpet happens to fold. Um, it could be, oh, you didn't realize that your molding was actually an Italian uh, design. Or just take a moment to notice something that's different or how it's set against something else. And now we can come back. This is one technique that's, yes, used in some religious practices like Buddhist and spiritual practices. And it's also used in trauma-sensitive training and, and, and uh, resilience uh, reinforcement, as we're wanting to call it these days. Um, and it helps us to counteract um, sometimes when our mind goes on those cycles and we're left with a bad feeling and we're building on some bad feeling, even if we don't know where it's coming from. Uh, so, the other thing is that, that we can do, and we, can, we should do often when we're at a computer, and we should do, um, is arms up. So, so when we bring our arms up, and I'm going to show you this, um, we, are, we are helping give space to our thorax, very important. Underarm thorax, very important to spaciousness when you're living with cardiopulmonary disease. Um, for any person. Um, um, and it also is good for our neck and our shoulders because our shoulders and our neck are attached to each other. So very quickly, I'm going to uh, walk you through Urdha Hastasana, which is um, a yoga technique, a yoga, uh, yoga, and many other forms of yoga. And what this does is it gets us to to love, it loves hard on our shoulders, it loves hard on our arms, um, and helps to re-educate those muscles that we're, that we're uh, tending forward, and, and also our rib, rib cage. So if you're able, we let our arms come up simply, and we can keep our hands up like this. If you're not able to lift up all the way, just go as far as your arms will let let them rise. And when your arms are up and your shoulders are relaxed and spread and your arms, other arms have nice wide sensation to them, you're going to be able to relax your shoulders enough to soften the neck a bit, give space to the neck and down. Um, the other option that you can do if you're able to do this is Ardhasasana which is interlacing the hands, bringing them in front of you, and lifting them up. And you, have, you only have to go as high as you feel the muscles, and then breathe into wherever the muscles are uh, feeling a little intense. You can also Reverse the interlace outward and notice if you're doing this, you might notice how your breath breathes up and under those muscles and allow yourself to come down again. The other thing that I'm going to show you is if you have a pillow, this is very nice and especially nice if you are lying down, um, bringing your arms up so that you're limited by the pillows with bringing your arms up and letting it track up through the front of your body gently listening 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 Ooh, that feels good under my shoulder blades Ooh, 
the chunky, chunky muscles below my neck and between my shoulders, and down. And you only go as high as you can. If you can only go this high, enjoy that height. Enjoy the breath sensation in that height. And um, if you're a person that um, spends a lot of time lying down, um, this is a very, very good exercise to do while lying down. Okay. Um, and the other thing I'm gonna say is arms up, yes, but you can also get up. And people, listen, please don't sit for longer than half an hour for any stretch. Please get up, move around. Our bodies are thirsty and they're thirsty to move. And especially if we're living with an autoimmune inflammatory disease, we have to move. Um, so I wanted to show here, um, because we just did our arms, these areas, the shoulder, the neck, you see how the neck muscles flow to the shoulders and down deep into the back. And look under here, the muscles, the space underneath, under the arms. The go-to words when we're moving our arms and our chests, I want everyone to maybe think about is cool awareness. And cool awareness may help us promote spaciousness amongst and between those muscles and those anatomical parts. Um, so keep, the, keep this in mind. And this, again, is a conversation that the body has with itself. When you notice that your mind is interrupting or feeling um, anxious or disappointed in yourself, um, just, if you can do this, if you can just soften to that sensation of aversion and redirect your mind once again, to the attention on your body and the conversation of bodies having with itself. So um, I, I wanted to talk a, a bit about how the body keeps the score. This is related to our times now living with COVID and also as a person living with a chronic illness or as a family member of a person living with a chronic illness. Um, Trauma is any sense of loss of control, use a sense of loss of power, something else has power over you and the decisions perhaps that you're making. Um, and you feel cornered perhaps or without choice. There was a really important study that was done in the United States that demonstrated, uh, and this is just looking at childhood experiences, but, but there's evidence to suggest this definitely translates to adult experiences, that adverse childhood experiences, um, no matter how mild, when you had more of them, um, a moderate amount of them, the amount that um, most people walking around in this country have, um, we had a higher score on this questionnaire. Um, uh, it, it translated to illness and earlier death. Um, and that there's fallout related to the way we take care of ourselves, sure. Uh, but, but there's also fallout related to cardiovascular disease, also related to voluntary things, sort of like smoking, et cetera. But these are things that we're not, have not teased the carpets yet. Um, but this is, this is the answer here that we have, that no matter how it turns out, no matter what the root causes or myriad causes are, um, when we experience these things, if, if we don't befriend ourselves and if we don't befriend our bodies, um, these, these experiences uh, can manifest into a pattern or, of, Ill, of um, illness. And so much work has been done. So much beautiful work has been done with your tax dollars. So great thing that's happening with our tax dollars is looking at how do we, how do we counter antidote? How do we antidote these events? And we can, and we do. And no matter how traumatic we can, and it's through a process called embodiment. Um, uh, not everybody calls it embodiment, but what it is, it's harnessing. Remember how I said that when you combine mindfulness practices with mindful movement, that has a, um, a more robust impact on, um, on psychology and psychological healing. Um, so this is using mindful movement um, and harnessing mindful movement, embodiment, making an opportunity for someone to feel at home in their bodies once again. Um, and uh, the data is beautiful. Um, 
um, I wish we could talk just about this for days and days and days, but it's out there. Um, so, um, um, can I just do a time check with you guys? How much time do I have left to speak? Well, we have, you have, um, it's 1245 right now. Okay. Um, so quarter of four. Quarter of four. So, um, thank you. So I wanted also for us to focus on the feet. The feet, the feet are uh, these powerhouses of intelligence that we don't pay enough attention to them. Um, and we're, we're focusing on paying more attention to feet in rehab. They are a convergence of neural networks um, in, uh, and provide intense information and feedback to our bodies, spinal cord. Um, they give all the feedback that we need for coordination and balance. Um, not all, some of it comes from our sacrum as well, but um, especially if you're a person that sits. Um, but it's, a, it's your, our feet are essential for all activities and breathing to propel the body. Um, and our bodies move more efficiently when our feet are sensitive and strong. Um, so uh, um, the other thing that I do wanna say is our, our feet, believe it or not, are quite important in the way we carry ourselves and in, in in lung disease, um, and they make moving through life when you have a lung dis disease or a cardiopulmonary disease that much uh, easier. Um, I don't think we have time to go through some of these um, exercises today, but um, I would say that perhaps um, folks um, could. Uh, find me on Facebook, uh, just pop in my last name, I think that's how it works, and, um, I, and I will have some of these exercises on, on there, um, and, um, but our feet are intelligent, and we want, to, we, we want to use them and feel the information of the surroundings that they provide to us. Um, Exercise is medicine. I just was going to talk about my friend Helena Alexanderson, uh, who proved definitively about exercise impact on inflammatory disease, lowering inflammatory profiles in the blood and uh, mitochondrial space, as well as recovering tissue done uh, as tested serious, serially and also in the context of people's lives. Amazing work. Uh, far-reaching work, um, and um, um, also at Dr. Anne Marie Russell, using these um, types of um, uh, exercises to augment the care of people living with pulmonary fibrosis. You might know her. Uh, she's she's from England. Um, you might know her as a pioneer of um, home-based spirometry as well as home-based management of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so I, um, I was going to talk here, uh, we'll do that, and we'll do that again at another time. Um, but right now, let's just take a few minutes just to go through this simple exercise that I want to share with everybody. And we won't do it fully. We'll, I'll, again, I'll capture it and stick it on the Facebook page. Um, but it's called 331. And what is it? Three minutes, three minutes, and one minute. So. It's three minutes of moving your arms from where they connect to your torso. Your arm can be bent, but you're not moving from your elbows. And you just listen as the arms move up and the arms move down. Do, and you try to avoid engaging momentum because the slower you move, the stronger you're going to get. And soon when you do this enough, you're going to get stronger and faster. And this is an application to everyday life. So three minutes. And, and these exercises are exercises that we use to set people up for pre-transplant. So if they're doing these exercises at home, um, you can do this again, as I said, seated. You can do this with your arms bent. If you keep your palms facing forward, it's easier for people that have shoulder problems. And what we do is try to engage with the sensation of the air on the skin. You can join me if you like. So that we've done for three minutes. Then we do three minutes of the legs. And so with the three minutes of the legs, we're listening to our body shift as our feet brush up and the leg lifts. And we're enjoying 
and we're riding on the sensations of this shifting. Again, you can do this sitting down and the legs are moving from the hips. We're not moving from the knees. So lifting and then we're not shifting only on the feet when you're sitting, if you happen to be sitting, we're shifting on our sit bones as well. And so we listen and move and get strong and deeply strong pretty quickly. So that's three minutes of arms, three minutes of legs, and one minute of getting up and out of a chair. And if you're in a bed, I will tell you what you're gonna be doing is drawing your legs into your abdomen and letting them release. Drawing your legs into your abdomen, and letting them release. But for those of us who are um, going to stand, um, it's very simple. And remember, you can hold on to anything, have a table in front of you or have a, um, or lean on something. But what we're doing, is simply listening to our body, softening the hip creases, and allowing the body to slowly, and listening all the way, and working hard not to let momentum rush in. So we're really riding on this movement and this sensation of air around our body, softening knees. So that's three, three, one. You could do it at home twice a day. So, uh, and, it, and it's really remarkable for developing um, deep strength. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> so I think because I know that you wanted to have time for question and answers, uh, question and answer time, correct? Yes, that is correct. We wanted to so, have a little bit of time. So we'll go to the, we, we will now, Go to that. Is that a good plan, Rob sure. and Gloria? I think, Rob yeah. and I think and that's Maureen? great. Maureen, are you there? Plan? Maureen? Yes, I am. I'm here. here. Perfect. Okay. okay. Great. So, um, Maureen, do you want me to take the first question or you want to go? Uh, by all means, it's up to you. I can happy to go first if you'd like. Okay. Um, Dr. Sakatu, is there um, an actual physical relationship that's been proven between the brain? and mindfulness exercises? Absolutely, absolutely. And this has been research over the past decades, starting with Dr. Harold Benson uh, in the 60s and 70s. And as our armamentarium of diagnostics improved for uh, both genetics and, um, and brain imaging, it was clear. It was clear, whether it's functional MRI, whether it's EEG, whether it's looking at patient questionnaires in terms of cognition, anxiety, or, or depression, um, um, it's clear that even a little bit of mindfulness and even a short course of mindfulness can have an impact, not just on, on these um, uh, functional uh, uh, tools, but also we notice that in the areas where we want the brain to be bigger, those neuronal networks amplify. And so the volume of that part of the brain increases and it also decreases in the areas that tend to be less helpful to us in everyday life, but because of stress, we've kind of over strengthened them. Um, so yes, hands, hands down, that's absolute. And we've also noticed that uh, not only for the brain, but uh, for the body on a genetic level, on a neuroimmunological level, um, that the epigenetics um, and actually the genetic structures are impacted by stress and an inter intervention of, of uh, mindfulness or, or stress reduction can help prevent um, unfavorable changes to the, gen to the genome. I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much. Um, someone had a question about whether you have additional advice for patients who are using um, oxygen. Addition, yes. So um, part of the work that we're doing um, um, uh, with Dr. Russell and myself that was supported by the Wetmore Foundation and also um, the Sarcoidosis Foundation of Awareness Foundation of Louisiana is to develop a series of exercises. 
for people living um, with cardiopulmonary diseases that included in uh, core exercises and some of the things that we were doing here. Um, so incorporating Pilates with yoga, et cetera, that's safe. But generally speaking, it's, um, it's important to know yourself if you're somebody who has an oxygen, supplemental oxygen requirement, it's very important that you know yourself. Um, and you've probably gotten to know yourself by using a, a pulse oximeter. And so you probably know when your oxygen is dipping. And, um, and those things that cause your oxygen to dip, you always want to prep by increasing your oxygen. The other things that you want to be careful, be mindful of, and if, and if you're staying in this mindful place, you should be able to um, keep your heart rate within a healthy range. You don't want your heart rate to be too fast. You don't want yourself tipping into a state where you're having to recover. Anything that we did today is perfectly fine and is going to build slowly. Uh, the slow movements are going to strongly build muscles. Um, so you don't have to necessarily worry about that. And the other thing that I'm going to say is, is that the more we increase our physical capacity, our heart rates adjust, our breathing, breathing adjusts, um, because we're, we're enhancing the rest of our body that supports our lungs. And so the lungs directly benefit. Um, so keep it, keep, keep, keep a listening mode to your body always. That's what mindfulness is about and um, keep it self-paced and, and you keep it safe. And that's true for pain as well, people who have pain or mobility issues. I hope that answered that question. Great, thank you very much. Maureen? Uh, Dr. Sakatu, is it, is it effective to do a two minute exercise in mindfulness or does it require a, a 10 minute block or a 20 minute block? I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you, whoever asked that question because I should have said it before. Um, any amount that we do builds the mindfulness muscle and is present for us in the day. And everything that we do, we can practice mindfulness, washing the dishes, taking a pleasurable approach to washing the dishes, even typing on a keyboard when we're feeling the keys underneath our fingers. Um, so, I, I tell my students, my undergrad students or the medical students um, or residents when I'm teaching, uh, uh, even three minutes a day, three minutes in the morning, um, it's good to try to go for 10, but what we're doing is we're developing and we're sensitizing ourselves to that way of being, of feeling beautiful in our minds, our hearts, and feeling beautiful moving through the space, whatever space that is that we're living and moving through. Great, thank you. And the final question we have, um, uh, one of the listeners wanted to know if you would be able to send us any Facebook or YouTube links to the exercises so that we can send it out to the participants. I would be so happy to do that. And um, can you see my friend? This is, this is Lilac Lavender Hazel Rose. Um, uh, so yes, I would be very happy to do that. It would be my deepest pleasure. Great. My greatest pleasure. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Robert, I think, at this point. Thank you. It helps to go off mute. Dr. Sakaku, thank you so much for your time today and for the active uh, webinar. Uh, instead of just sitting in one's chair watching passively, uh, you gave us the opportunity to get up and move around during it as well. And thank you for showing that and sharing your expertise with us. Uh, for everyone who is uh, watching, again, we will make this available um, after the fact. It, it was recorded. And uh, we will also get those, um, that, those links that were asked in the last question of Dr. Sakaku. So uh, stay tuned for more of that. And uh, please uh, stay tuned for more information about upcoming webinars as well. Again, I'd like to thank um, 
our colleagues at SRF and Scleroderma Canada for joining us and in, in co-sponsoring and co-hosting this webinar today. Dr. Sakaku, thank you again for your time. Mm -hmm. And we are at the top of the hour, so we will say goodbye for now. Stay well and stay safe, everyone. Thank you and have thank a good you. afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye.